Well, hello there. How are you? Welcome to Crime Dive. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So that is what I talk about. If you like true crime and you also want to feel better about your makeup skills, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and let's hang out together every Tuesday where I will take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on the old clown paint. So yeah, how are you? How's it going? Are you ready to conclude this week's case that we started last week? The case of Crystal Rogers, who disappeared out of Bardstown, Kentucky. Sorry again, had to break this up into two parts. Like I said, I feel like I, I could have pushed and, and made it into one video, but man, just really busy. Had to take my, my kitty in for a, a dental appointment. He had six teeth removed and it's just been a lot. Uh, to take care of him uh, afterwards. And man, I've gotten like no sleep and I'm actually amazed I'm sitting here recording right now. So yeah, thank you so much for being patient. And yeah, let's let's dive back into our case that we started last week. All right, disappearance of Crystal Rogers. Thank you so much to Casey Gibbs in the comments for pointing me towards Bardstown, Kentucky, which has numerous unsolved high profile cases. Crystal's is one of those. If you will remember from last Last week, Crystal went missing July 3rd, 2015, supposedly last seen in the company of her live-in boyfriend, Brooks Houck, and their two-year-old child, Eli. And then we kind of went over how the Ballards, Crystal's family, was sort of suspicious of Brooks right from the get-go. He displayed some definitely questionable behavior, I would say, including not going once to search for Crystal. And if you remember, we kind of just went sort of point by point the, the breaking news of the case, right? Including including Brooke's brother, Nick Houck, being fired from his job as a police officer with the Bardstown Police Department after he had interfered in the investigation of Crystal. And, you know, we went over all of that. And if you will remember, last week we ended with the farm where Crystal was last seen with Brooks and Eli being searched. There was a massive search that had been conducted in the summer of 2016. It was searched by, you know, such agencies such as the FBI and the Louisville Metro PD, you know, and at this point in the case, if you remember, it was the largest search that had been conducted on the farm thus far. So that's sort of where we ended and we don't know what evidence was collected from this search. If you remember last week, we discuss this as well, any evidence that has been collected from law enforcement from any of these searches that have been conducted, no one knows publicly what evidence, you know, if any was collected. The law enforcement agencies are extremely tight lipped about what they have collected and what's, you know, going on. So we don't know, you know, what evidence they had seized during this, you know, 2016 search, but it was a, a pretty massive search and they certainly did a thorough thorough look of all of the woods and like uh, ponds and little lakes on the property. And now, unfortunately, let's, let's continue our look into this case. And we're going to start off right off the bat with some just awful, awful news. So if you will remember, we talked a little bit about Crystal's family. They've been very vocal and active in the media in trying to, you know, keep Crystal's case alive and get information and all that good stuff. And if you will remember, we talked about her father, Tommy Ballard. He was so dedicated in finding his daughter. He himself conducted numerous searches, paying for all kinds of search parties and all kinds of stuff. And if you'll remember, we talked about, you know, part of the reason, you know, why he was so dedicated in finding his daughter was he had already had tragedy in his life with his sister, Frida, being murdered by her estranged husband. If you'll remember, we briefly went into that. So let's continue our discussion a little bit about Tommy. And unfortunately today's video, we're going to open up with his death. That is right. That is right. Tommy Ballard died without knowing what happened to his daughter, without Crystal's case being solved. So on Saturday, November 19th, 2016, Tommy Ballard, who was only 54 years old, died while he was hunting with Casey, that was Crystal's brother, Tommy's son, Casey's son, and one of Crystal's sons, Trenton, who was 12. They were in an area off of Ed Brent Road, which was a rural area outside of Bardstown. 
town. Now, this piece of land they were hunting on was family owned. It had been in the family for at least a decade. And this was a yearly tradition that the family had. So Tommy was in this field and it was early, early in the morning, like pre-dawn, you know, they had gotten out to that property super, super early. So it was still pretty dark out. This area of the family's property that he was on was near the Bluegrass Parkway, the BG. And it was while he was waiting for 12-year-old Trenton to retrieve something from the truck that Tommy was shot once through the chest with the bullet entering his chest and exiting out his back. And it is said that he died instantly. Yeah, can you believe that, guys? Can you believe that? Is that not... (sighs) Not just a heartbreaking but wild update to this case. So in approximately a year and a half after Crystal's disappearance, Tommy was now shot. And again, it's just so weird because this was family property. Like I said, in the documentary that I watched, which I will discuss briefly later on, this property had been in the family for at least a decade or so. And this was a yearly tradition around this time of year. The family would always go out hunting off this property. Now, Casey said that him and his son were in their pickup truck in the front of the property because, you know, it was a large piece of land. So Casey and his son were in the front of the property in their truck. You know, again, in the pre-dawn morning, still pretty dark. And Tommy and Trenton had went to the back of the property in their, in uh, Tommy's truck. And then there was like some sort of a uh, farm property on the land as well. Now, Trenton said that as him and his grandfather, Tommy, were walking, he forgot something in the truck and realized that. So he turned around to, you know, jog the few yards back to the truck to retrieve it. Trenton said that he heard the single gunshot just as he approached the truck, and he figured it was his grandfather taking aim at some game that he had seen. Casey said he was sitting in his truck talking with his son, and just as he turned around in the back to retrieve something from the back of the truck, that's when he heard the single gunshot. Trenton ended up calling up Sherry and told her, quote, Mama, Papa's been shot. He called Casey as well, screaming, crying, panicking. Of course, he was 12 years old, and he heard the gunshot went back to check on his grandfather and he's lying there in a pool of blood. Like, of course he'd be like freaked out and shocked, right? So, you know, Trenton called Casey, you know, freaking out, explaining what happened. And Sherry said when she got to the scene, she saw Tommy lying on the ground, eyes wide open, just staring blankly up. And she like cried over his body. Like her other family members had to like pull her off of him. Like, dear God, dude, I just, I can't, imagine having to go through that. I mean, her daughter's already missing. She's already like kind of estranged from her youngest grandson. Remember we talked about the custody issues in the last video, but now her husband has been shot. It just unbelievable. I was so shocked and heartbroken when, you know, I came across this in my research. So like I said, Tommy died instantly and he was pronounced dead at the scene. Kentucky State Police Trooper Jeff Gregory said that they had been called in to help with the scene by the Nelson County Sheriff's Office just before 8 a.m. on that Saturday. And the Sheriff's Office just told them that they needed help with a, quote, death investigation. Trooper Gregory declined to elaborate further to the media because this story was very quick to break. He said, quote, to describe it as anything else at this time would be irresponsible. Responsible. And again, talking about the classification of this as a death investigation, the media and the law enforcement officials were very careful about calling Tommy's death a, a homicide or a, a murder right after it happened. They did tell the media that Tommy was in the company of a juvenile when he was shot, but they didn't name, you know, Trenton in, in the article and they didn't state what the relationship was. Gregory said he did not know who had initially called in the death and reiterated that they themselves hadn't heard of it until the Nelson County Sheriff's Office called them asking for their assistance. So the Sheriff's Office, along with the Kentucky State Police and the Fish and Wildlife Department all swarmed the scene of Tommy's death. Again, Gregory declined to really elaborate to media what exactly they were doing, just saying that they were gathering evidence and to keep the Ballards in your thoughts. Quote, say your prayers for this family. They've been through a lot. Yeah, that's an understatement. Like this poor family, dude. It's just, it's not fair how some families, how some people can be exposed to so much tragedy. Like it's, it's just not right. By Monday, November 21st, Kentucky State Police detectives did announce that the juvenile with Tommy was his grandson. And they stated that Trenton was not, you know, a suspect or anything like that. And his grandfather's death was not at fault. He was just there at the scene of his grandfather's death, unfortunately. They also announced 
house, they were still determining the cause of death before they would officially rule it a homicide. They asked, you know, of course, anyone, anyone with the public with any information to contact the KSP office in Elizabethtown. Specifically, quote, those who had been traveling the Bluegrass State Parkway between mile markers 21 and 25 just before 7.30 a.m. who may have seen vehicles or persons in the roadway. As an agency, anytime we have a death scene, we carefully gather and monitor the evidence and the facts as they are presented or as we discover them. There are numerous things which must be considered before a cause of death ruling is made, as well as deciding on how to title an investigation. We are consistent on how we handle all death investigations before we determine the cause and before we decide if there is any criminal intent. At this time, this unfortunate incident is still labeled as a death investigation. So there were, of course, a lot of people were, you know, assuming like this was obviously a murder, right? I mean, what's the first thing that comes to your guys' mind, right? When I tell you, you know, especially after everything we've talked about with Tommy and Crystal's disappearance, right? Like your knee jerk assumption is gonna be like, oh my God, this was totally related to his daughter's death, right? Or disappearance, presumed death. Obviously it's connected somehow, right? And it's kind of hard not to think that, right? I mean, what do you guys think? Obviously I had to have been connected, right? Like the whole setup of his of his death is just so strange. And, you know, we'll get into it. They talk a little bit about it in the uh, documentary that I watched. Like it's just, it's just very bizarre and strange. This was, you know, family property. This was property they had owned and had hunted on for many, many years. This was an annual tradition. And it's not too beyond the realm of believability that Maybe someone was lying in wait and, you know, took Tommy out. Maybe he was getting close to finding out what happened to his daughter. Who knows, you know? But I also, you know, at the same time, I understand law enforcement, you know, like their hesitancy to just straight up say like, oh yeah, obviously this was murdered. And, you know, obviously this was, you know, related to Crystal's case, right? Like you can't just make blanket statements like that without any evidence. I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much speculation in this case is just there's so much information that law enforcement just has not released at this time. So even though KSP and, you know, the the Nelson County Sheriff's Office, they all came out with like these official statements that, you know, they were still investigating it. There were, you know, rumors going around that behind the scenes, like the, the actual like law enforcement officers, like on the beat, on the ground work in the case were already, you know, kind of investigating it as a homicide. Now, Sherry, of course, did not shy away at all from assuming that her husband's death, you know, was connected to Crystal's disappearance. And, you know, I don't blame her. That would be my knee-jerk assumption. She said, quote, I do not feel like this was an accident. I think someone wanted my husband out of the way because we were getting close to Crystal and they knew he was the driving force behind her. Till Bullard, Tommy's father, said that his son had actually planned a very large out-of-town search for Crystal for the weekend after his death. He said, quote, Tommy always said, I'll spend my last dime trying to find Crystal. I guess he's found her now. Yeah, isn't that... That's just so sad, man. So sad. He just wanted to find his daughter and he died never, never finding out what happened to her. That's, I think, really the bitch of it, you know? You know, now after watching like a lot of video clips and stuff with Sherry and Tommy, like, yeah, that was just... That was really heartbreaking to come across that part of the case. So this next part I'm going to talk about is just more interesting. There's nothing really nefarious or malicious about it. It's just kind of interesting how many fires follow Brooks around. So on Wednesday, November 23rd, a house owned by Brooks burnt down. Lakeisha Rogers and her three children actually rented this home from Brooks and thankfully they were not at home when the home caught on fire. Lakeisha's father, Brian, said that she had left to go to a job orientation and the kids were with their father in uh, Louisville. So thankfully, you know, none of them were home or or injured or anything with the fire. So that's good. Bardstown Police Department officer Reese Riley was the first on scene. And, you know, he knocked down the door and made sure there was like nobody inside before, you know, assessing the situation. And by the time the fire department showed up, the house was like fully engulfed in flames. The house would end up having extensive damage. Lakeisha's aunt, Austin, just told the press, quote, I just thank God they weren't in there. By 10 a.m., both Lakeisha and Brooks were actually on scene surveying the damage. Keisha stated that she had no idea what could have caused the fire. She said the heat did go out the night before and she had run the washer and dryer that morning for a little bit. And she did know that the hot water heater was 
located in the kitchen, and it was looking like this was the source of the fire. Bardstown Fire Chief Randy Walker told the press that they did not yet have a cause to the fire, and that firefighters were going to be on scene all day, sifting through everything. He said, quote, it's going to be a long process. So again, not that um, there was anything nefarious, like I'm not trying to insinuate like, oh yeah, Brooks set the, the house on fire or anything, but yeah, as we'll see, like there, w- there will be another instance where a fire uh, associated with Brooks happens, and just thought it was interesting. Um, again, as I go through this case, I, you know, come across interesting updates. And I know at first when this was reported, people, you know, of course, because it had to do with Brooks Hauk, they're like, oh, does this have something to do with Crystal's like disappearance? But no, I, like, I think it was just, you know, one of those things that was a house fire. And yeah, because I come across and we'll talk about it, another fire related to Brooks that happens, I just thought it was interesting. By December of 2016, the police had still not classified Tommy's death a homicide. At this time, Sherry had gone to the local media with her suspicions that she didn't care what the what the police said or what they classified it as. She knew that her husband had been murdered. She stated not only did she believe Tommy was murdered, but he was murdered because he was getting close to finding out what had happened to Crystal. She firmly believed that the two uh, things were related. And again, it's not really hard to imagine that leap logic, right? I mean, I certainly, like, I certainly think it might have something to do with that. Like, because that's just really weird, especially the way that he died, you know? Sherry also told media at this time that Tommy believed he was being followed in the days prior to his death. After almost two years after Crystal's disappearance and six months after Tommy's death in May of 2017, it was announced that two retired Kentucky State Troopers had been hired not just to investigate Crystal's disappearance and Tommy's death, but the other high-profile unsolved cases that plagued Bardstown. They had, you know, were going to hire these two investigators whose sole purpose and responsibility was to solve these cases. Lieutenant Michael Webb, a state police spokesman, said, quote, a community has been rocked by these cases. He refused to name who the two troopers were, but the public did know that they had been hired full time on a contractual basis. And Webb said that they had been, quote, kind of handpicked after state police commissioner Rick Sanders had proposed the idea of like dedicating some resources purely on the Bardstown cases. Webb said, quote, these are guys that have extensive and seasoned investigative experience. Webb also told the public at this time that police had not ruled out the possibility that all of the Bardstown cases could be connected. Not saying that they believed that, just saying that, you know, that had not been ruled out as a possibility. He also stated at this time that homicide had definitely not been ruled out in Tommy's case either. He stated that the Elizabethtown State Police had dedicated thousands of hours in trying to solve Tommy's case and the other Bardstown cases. They stated they had assisted the Nelson County Sheriff's Office with Crystal's case, but, you know, hers wasn't the only one, you know, taking up their time. Quote, as life goes on and time goes on, things compete for their time. Hence the hiring of these two additional troopers slash investigators. Webb said as the state police work the Bardstown cases, these two officers would, quote, focus on them. Because yeah, certainly by this time, the Bardstown cases had made national headlines. And yeah, people, people were scratching their head wondering like, okay, what was going on? Like, do you have a bunch of like psycho killers running around? Is there corruption in the police? Is that why they haven't been solved? Is it incompetence? Is it lack of resources? Like what's going on? Like people were starting to ask questions. On July 5th, 2017, to mark two years since her disappearance, a memorial was held for Crystal at the St. Thomas Church in Bardstown. The 45 minute service was, you know, of course, very emotional for Crystal's family, especially because, you know, they were still trying to grieve Tommy's death. It was especially emotional for, you know, Sherry, of course. Uh, She said, quote, one of our little granddaughters told us, she said, mama, he was going to bring mama home to us. So it's very hard. Mary Taylor, remember, we said she was the family friend and she would actually organize every vigil and memorial held in Crystal's honor. She said at the service, quote, heaven must be beautiful as you are in the arms of your daddy. His daily ambition was to find you and he is no longer in agony. Yeah, man, people really felt for the Ballards. Like they were all, they already felt for the Ballards because of Crystal's disappearance, you know, and seeing Tommy and Sherry, you know, on camera and just begging for any answers. Like, how could you not feel for them? But yeah, then Tommy's death on top of that, like it, the community really, really came out in full force in support of the Ballards. Then on July 25th, 
another search warrant was served on Anna's home. Remember Anna Whitesides, Brooks Houck's grandmother? Yeah, another search warrant was served on her home. Floyd, Anna's attorney, verified this, stating that it was the fifth search warrant served on Anna's home. And in general, police were looking for guns, ammunition, reloader equipment, and other items. He said, quote, my vague understanding is that they were looking for bullets in a reloader and they may have left with the reloader. He did state that any items taken into evidence from Anna's home as a result of the search were not Anna's. And he also told the press, because again, the law enforcement were being very tight-lipped, he believed that this search warrant right here was in relation to Tommy's death. And police refused to verify whether it was in relation to Tommy or Crystal's case, just saying that the search warrant was served as part of an ongoing investigation and they would not discuss it. And I wonder why the police are so tight-lipped about everything. Because, you know, in some investigations, they're very open and they say a lot uh, to the public. But maybe in these cases, maybe in all the Bardstown cases, because they're so high profile, because you're dealing with a small town, so, you know, word gets around, maybe that's why they're keeping everything on the hush-hush. I know some people think maybe there's a more malicious explanation, like maybe cover-up or incompetence. This is what just, you know, people were saying about the cases so far that I saw when I was doing my research. Trooper Gregory also declined to elaborate to the media about the search warrants or like any updates in Tommy or Crystal's cases, just repeating that it was all part of an ongoing investigation. In August, Tommy's brothers, Mike and Roger, announced a $20,000 reward for anyone who came forward with information that led to an arrest in their brother's death. They also reminded the public that they still had the like $70,000 reward for Crystal and any information that led to her whereabouts. They also stated that they all that they did believe that Tommy's death and Crystal's disappearance were related. That definitely seemed to be the, the common belief with, you know, everyone in Bardstown and those who were following the case. Then only a few days after a search warrant was served on Anna's home, get this, on July 28th, Nelson County Sheriff's detectives arrested the then girlfriend of Brooks Houck, Crystal Maupin. I don't know if they're still together. That's why they have phrased it that way. At this point in time in 2017, in July when she's arrested, she was currently dating Brooks. So get this, the Ballards, you know, we talked about this in the last video, had lots of signs plastered all around Bardstown. Not just with like Crystal's picture and information and like, have you seen me? But there were, you know, numerous other signs, you know, praying for Crystal's safe return, support the Ballards, like general signs of support for the Ballards and, you know, Crystal's case. So get this, get this. This skank here decided that she actually didn't like these signs, all right? And so Crystal here decided to go ahead and tear down any signs that she saw that had support for the Ballards or information for Crystal's case. Yeah, can you believe that? So a surveillance video from the local Circle K shows Crystal, quote, getting out of her car and taking the signs. This sign that she took in the video was specifically the standing with the Ballard sign. She was charged with theft by unlawful taking and was released from jail the same day that she had been arrested after she had posted bond. Sherry was, you know, of course, pretty upset at, at everything. She said, quote, why wouldn't she help us? Why wouldn't she give us all the support if he is so innocent like he says he is? And she just, yeah, she was like, who is this bitch to sit here and like tear up our signs and, you know, this, that, and the other, like she's dating Brooks. If he's such a great guy, then like, yeah, why, why do they care if these signs are around, you know? In September, Crystal was then ordered by the court to write an apology letter to Sherry, which didn't really seem to be like a very good one. Uh, Cause Sherry told the press, quote, she could have just said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my actions. But instead it's like she was trying to defend herself. Crystal explained in her letter that she stole the signs because of the behavior of some of the people driving by her house. And because someone had said something to her that day when she was getting gas and she didn't like it. She ended in her letter by saying, quote, I see how my reaction may have been hurtful to your family, though my action was really in response to the behavior of others. Yeah, don't you love non-apologies? What a skank. Like, what the hell? What is your problem? I really don't care how other people are treating you. First of all, you're openly dating someone who's been named as the number one suspect slash person of interest in a high-profile disappearance. So, you know, if you can't handle that, 
Maybe don't date Brooks Houck, you know what I'm saying? And secondly, just because people were sitting there giving you a hard time, that has nothing to do with the Ballards or these signs around. Like, they're not giving you a hard time. I don't know. I just thought, like, what a weak excuse. Sherry said, quote, To me, it was like she was making excuses for what she did. That's not an apology to me. So I can't accept something that's not an apology. Mm-hmm. Damn right. I just thought that, what a, what a wild update. Not to mention, I just... Look, man, even if, you know, turns out Brooks is innocent, all right? So let's, you know, let, let's say that, like, it turns out, like, he's innocent. I, I wouldn't be dating anyone who's, like, a, a high-profile suspect or person of interest in a case. Like, I would just be like, you know what? I'll just, I'll wait for this to uh, work itself out, and then maybe we'll talk about going on a date. So I don't know. I just think it's weird. Big shock. There's a lot of people, right, who, you know write love letters to serial killers, for example. So not not too shocking that someone like this would still be dating, you know, Brooks. And then getting offended when people like call her out. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't really have any sympathy for her at all. Especially because, yeah, like take it out on those people then. Don't take it out on signs that aren't even yours. You know what I mean? It's just, what a weird reaction. And on the eve of the one year anniversary of Tommy's death on November 18th, 2017, literally like overnight, it was really weird overnight, mysterious signs cropped up all over Bardstown. And these signs were not shy in uh, what, what they thought. Whoever made those signs really thought. They read, quote, detectives say Brooks Houck killed Rogers. Yeah. Now Sherry and of course the Ballards were contacted like, oh, did you guys like put these up? And they had no idea where the signs came from. It, they didn't come from them or anyone that they knew. And they said they had no idea who'd put them up. But yeah, I just thought how strange that it popped up like on the eve of the one year anniversary of Tommy's death. You know, this is a small community. People talk people know each other. And frankly, after, you know, living in small towns for a good chunk of my life, I'm actually not really surprised that something like this would happen. You're in a small town, like I said, people, people know people and people are going to react emotionally to Crystal's disappearance. You know, the community was really startled by this. So not really surprised, really. And then for a while, there's not really any updates to the case, not directly related to the case anyway. So the next update that I came across happened in April of 2018. So in April of 2018, Brooks was arrested. I know, shocker, right? But it had nothing to do with Crystal's case. He was arrested on theft charges after he was accused of stealing hundreds of dollars worth of like shingles from the local Lowe's. They said he sold out over 200 bundles over the course of 11 days. But uh, there were many who noted that there were lots of federal, state, and local officers going in and out of Brooks' home. And they were carrying not just shingles, but like computer modems and like files and stuff. A neighbor, Sammy Johnson, told the papers, quote, This was supposed to be about shingles. And why do you have the federal agents that are searching? This ain't about shingles, I don't think. I think it's bigger. There was one article that said Sammy was actually related to the Ballards. But yeah, either way, a lot of people um, were scratching their head uh, watching as, you know, I think it was the, the federal agents being involved um, that really had people kind of like, is this really about shingles? Maybe the feds used that as an excuse to search his house or something. I don't know. Brooks was given a $25,000 cash bond, a dusk to dawn curfew, and he faced four felony counts of theft. He pleaded not guilty to the charges in August of that year. And this was during his arraignment, which, of course, Sherry did show up to. She said, quote, I honestly wish it was for my daughter. I wait for that day every minute, every second of my life. But to see him here for anything, I will take that. I'll wait for the day that I see him in court for my daughter. Brooks' trial for these theft charges was set in January of 2019. And it was moved to Warren County due to his, you know pretty infamous reputation in Nelson County at this point. And the trial would ultimately be held in April of 2019. And a jury ultimately found Brooks not guilty. It was kind of, kind of boring. Um, it turned out, I don't know, it seemed like it was a huge misunderstanding. And so the jury acquitted Brooks of any theft charges. And from, yeah, what I read, it sounded like he didn't really steal anything. It was just a massive, massive miscommunication um, and, and a little error on the employee's part. In June of 2018, Brooks actually spoke for the first time in public. So remember, this was in June of 2018. So just a couple months after he had been arrested on those theft charges. And he spoke with a local news agency and he didn't really say much. He only said, quote, I have been advised, you know, to ride the wave and keep on keeping on. And that's what I've done. And it's worked out great this far. I don't have anything to say. 
I really don't have anything to say. I really don't have anything to say because I don't know anything. So I really don't have anything to say. Yeah. Did you guys count how many times he said, I don't have anything to say? Like, yeah, it was very weird. So like that was like the only public statement that Brooks has, has said to local media since all this broke, since, you know, his appearance on Nancy Grace. Sherry said in response to what Brooks said, quote, why would he ride the wave? Why wouldn't he want to know where my daughter is at? It's like he's not interested in finding my daughter. If somebody accuses me of something, I'm going to fight back and I'm going to prove my innocence. I think Brooks Houck killed my daughter. Yeah, she was not being shy about her opinions at this point, you know. Detective Snow commented on the case at this point, sort of giving an update. He stated that they think that they got the evidence that they need, but there was still a lot of testing that still needed to be done. And as we know, right, this testing and processing of evidence can take years. And that was basically what he was saying. He's like, you know, we're pretty sure we got the evidence that we need to, you know, go forward. We need to wait on those results, though. And unfortunately, that stuff takes a pretty long time, right? Detective Snow said, quote, if I'm going to keep an edge when it comes to the investigation, there has to be things about the case that have to be only known by the case officer and a select few other people. And he did state at this time that Nick was also a suspect in Crystal's disappearance. In July of 2018, a service slash memorial slash vigil was held once again at the St. Thomas Church in Bardstown. Sherry said, quote, it's hard to move on. You can't move on. You think about her constantly. Crystal's sister, Brooke, had married and had a baby at this point. And she talked about how like the anniversaries and like the big milestones were the toughest to get through. Quote, it's like a fresh cut all over again. She was my best friend. I just want to know what happened. I'm telling you, man, I don't know how the Ballards have survived this long. I could not go through a quarter of what this family has endured, man. It's bad enough to already have like a family history with like Frida's unfortunate, you know, murder. But, you know, to have Crystal then disappear and then Tommy like a little over a year later, like that's, that's a lot. Like poor Poor Sherry, her daughter, and then her husband, guys. Come on. Sherry and Brooke put together 300 pink mason jars that had a flower in them and then like crystals like information and like info on the side of them. And uh, local businesses were going to put them in the window as, you know, a remembrance of Crystal. And again, keeping her, uh, her case alive out there, you know. The Ballards did such a good job of making sure Crystal's case stayed in the media's like scope. Sherry said her and Brooke were doing this uh, thing with like the mason jars, you know, um, in order to quote, paint the town pink in honor of Crystal's favorite color. She said, quote, if I don't keep her name out there, people are just going to forget. But if I keep this out there, people are going to know we're never going to forget Crystal. Over 200 people showed up to the St. Thomas Church to, you know, pay respects to Crystal and, you know, just kind of show their support for the Ballards. As we said before, Mary Taylor organized it. And she said, quote, those five kids, they're so grateful and so thankful that you remember their mother. And that's why we do it. At this time, the family also announced that the reward leading to any information that led to Crystal's whereabouts or an arrest had been upped to $100,000, thanks in large part uh, to donations. They also reminded the public they still had that $20,000 reward for any information that led to arrest in Tommy's case as well. In August of 2018, Oxygen, the TV channel, made a six-part documentary following Crystal's case called The Disappearance of Crystal Rogers. Crystal's case was also featured in an hour-long special with Paula Zahn on Discovery, Investigation Discovery. But I went ahead and watched the Oxygen series, you know, so so you don't have to, you know, figured I would watch it and let you guys know uh, what, if any, relevant parts there were. And overall, you know, it was, you know, it's a pretty decent documentary. I think people need to remember when you're watching a document documentary. Good Lord, I can't talk. Especially a documentary about a case that is ongoing and unsolved. They need to temper their their expectations a little bit. On some sites like IMDb, I feel like people were pretty harsh with the documentary, kind of like judging it for not really showing any new information. But it's like, dude, it aired in August of 2018, which means they probably filmed it bare minimum, what, like six months ago or something. So like, 
any like groundbreaking information they would have had, you would have heard about it already. You know what I mean? So I think some people just had different expectations. Considering it was oxygen, I honestly did not have a whole lot of expectations, but I wanted to watch it because I know, you know, Crystal's family did interviews and that's really why I like watching documentaries or something like that is uh, the families will usually give interviews and stuff and you usually get to learn a little bit more about like the victim or their life or, you know, their family or something like that. And I like that personally. So overall, the, the documentary was okay. Um, it kind of fell into the same trap that a lot of these made for TV documentaries for... <laughs> networks such as Oxygen fall into. And that like, it starts off pretty good, you know, with relevant information and some more background information and like some like cold hard facts. And then they start doing their like dramatization nonsense, um, hyping up stuff just with like filming and editing techniques. And that's like, okay, but like, yeah, then they just sort of towards like the last part of the documentary, because of course, you know, they just have to make stuff as long as possible, even if it's not warranted. It just just sort of, I don't know, comes off as like hokey and undermining everything. So I thought like the first like three episodes or so were, were pretty good. And I did like that they bring in experts in these fields. They're usually like retired people or something. So in the Oxygen documentary, they had a retired homicide detective with like 40 years experience, Dwayne Statton. And he helped the journalist in the documentary, Stephanie Bauer. She was the uh, journalist for Oxygen. What I, what I do like about documentaries like this is, you know, like I said, getting like like a, an expert, former expert, uh, getting their thoughts on the case and stuff. And so like they were talking to this Dwayne Stanton guy, this retired homicide detective. And I just thought it was interesting kind of getting his perspective on the case a little bit. Um, he said one thing that he thought personally that was odd for him. I mean, again, he was just speaking from his own anecdotal experience. He thought it was weird that the police had not released like any further information of Crystal's case by this point. He was like, you know, obviously in high profile cases like this, you, you know, it makes sense. You you keep stuff close to the chest and whatnot. But in his experience, you know, when when he worked cases at, at his department, after uh, several years, you know, especially if it was a high profile case, they would eventually release some kind of information, you know, usually in order to get a fresh, a fresh perspective or something. And he did note that he thought that was kind of weird that, you know, none of the law enforcement officials had done that in Crystal's case. And again, because it's a documentary, they definitely tried to like dramatize this this bit that he was saying. But I, I thought Stanton did a pretty good job of just sort of reiterating like, look, this is just sort of my two cents on this, on how like I handled homicides or whatever, you know. He was, was very good of reiterating like, we don't really know what they know. We don't know their process or anything. I'm just giving my observation based on, you know, my experience. Experience. In the documentary, they did examine Crystal's car. So it was revealed at this point, all right, in the documentary. And this was actually pretty shocking to me that Sherry had Crystal's car. The police had released the car back into Sherry's custody like mere days after it had been discovered. That was a, was a little shocking to me. Like, is that shocking to you? Because I feel like they'd want to hold on to it, right? I mean, it's her vehicle, it was found, even if we're going with the theory that like Crystal herself didn't drive the car, surely there'd be evidence about like who did, right? So that was pretty shocking to me. So Sherry had kept Crystal's car in this uh, storage unit. Sherry had a storage unit business and she kept Crystal's car in a storage unit there. And so in the documentary, they paid to, you know, have it examined professionally. Now, first right off the bat, when uh, Stanton is looking at the car, he's like, oh wow, this is kind of weird. I don't see any like leftover dust or anything like that that shows law enforcement dusted this for prints. And again, trying to reiterate, like this doesn't mean that, you know, they didn't take prints. It's just odd that I'm not seeing any leftover residue or something that is usually there when you take, when you dust for fingerprints, you know? In fact, I'm not gonna lie. It was pretty shocking to see what was still inside Crystal's car. All the items in her car, you know, like like drinks and, and cup holders and like, you know, just like random stuff in her seat and stuff was still there, which I thought that was weird because you'd think that they would like collect and bag everything, right? Like it's potential evidence. You don't know like how this was used, you know? So that was pretty shocking. When they opened the trunk of the car, there was still like grass and dirt and like dust. Like clearly they hadn't like vacuumed to examine the dust. Again, something that you would expect, right? That you would think that they would be taking everything out of the trunk, 
cleaning it and bagging it for evidence, you know? And Stanton was explaining that's, you know, what, what his process in his department when he was a homicide detective would have been. They would have vacuumed out the trunk, for example, taken the carpet out and tested it and all that good stuff. And that just, you know, hadn't happened. So the documentary brought in a former KSP trooper who now runs his own business reconstructing crime scenes and stuff. His name is Joey Stidham. And so the documentary paid to have his team come in and they were going to like, you know, come in and like process Crystal's vehicle. Now, Stidham noted that he was not at all surprised at the state of Crystal's vehicle, that there was still debris and items inside and stuff like that. He said that did not surprise him at all. And he said the reason this didn't surprise him is that the resources for forensic testing and this kind of stuff in the state of Kentucky is virtually non-existent. He said, in fact, the funding is so little and so minuscule in the state of Kentucky that the KSP crime lab will actually only process and test 10 pieces of evidence per case. Yeah, you heard that right. So if you had like 50 pieces of evidence um, in like a murder case, the crime lab would only test 10 of them. Isn't that wild? Now, Stidham said that like there are ways around this, you know, usually like court orders and stuff like that, you know, judges signing off and that kind of stuff. So that takes some time. But yeah, by and large, most of the time, it's 10 pieces of evidence. He also said that is why most Kentucky authorities, they'll usually like do cursory searches, no like forensic testing or processing, again, because of the lack of funding. Like, isn't that wild? How much do you want to bet that uh, Kentucky officials love to run on a tough on crime stance? Sidham also noted that he himself personally had testified in numerous homicide trials throughout his career where there were hundreds of pieces of evidence that were never tested ever or processed. So when the documentary had Stedham and his team come in and test, um, he of course was like, oh yeah, this was like a bad forensics job on the part of the uh, police officials. Like, look at all the stuff left in the car, yada, yada, yada. Based on what he told the documentary, now we're not really all that surprised, right? Plus you, you loop in the fact that this is like a rural area and stuff. Who knows how much experience these officials had had? In, in murder cases and disappearances, high profile cases in general, you know what I mean? So all these factors I feel had a hand in explaining why her car was in the state that it was in, probably explains why it was released to Sherry so quickly as well, right? So the documentary, you know, Stidham and his team, you know, properly bagged all the evidence and tested it and stuff like that. And they tried in the documentary, they tried really hard to make a big deal about this um, one spot in the trunk where, cause they, they sprayed like Blue Star, you know, Luminol, all throughout the car. And in the trunk, the documentary tried to make this big deal about like, oh, they found this like big spot in the trunk. Like what? Like, is there blood or DNA there? There was a large section in the back right corner of the trunk that, you know, had lit up with the uh, the Blue Star is what they called it. But they said it was essentially Luminol. And in both Stidham and Stanton's professional, you know, opinion, it usually only lit up like that in the presence of blood. Although they did go out of their way to state that, you know, there were a lot of plants proteins and other stuff that were also known to react to it. So they tried to make a big deal about that. They had also brought in a cadaver dog, um, a dog who had actually helped search for Crystal at one point. And the documentary, you know, brought the dog and, and its handler in and tried to make a big deal that the dog like barked at the trunk and like got in the trunk and the handler was like, oh yeah, the dog is like making all the signs that, you know, it's trying to tell me that there's a presence of like human remains in this trunk. And so, of course, right with the documentary, they tried to make, oh, look, they, they found this like lit up spot in the trunk. And now the cadaver dog is jumping in the trunk. What? Was there blood or DNA in there? So they tried to like build it all up, right? However, after they had had the trunk analyzed, like they had like the carpet and the fibers and everything tested, turns out, Wah, wah, wah. There was no DNA in there. The lab, uh, they had a person from the lab come in and talk to the documentary. Um, they said that like there was one like teeny, tiny, minuscule part in the back right corner of the trunk that could have possibly had DNA. And, you know, since the documenter was paying for it, they decided to have that tested, but the lab couldn't test it. And I was confused on if they couldn't test it because the sample was so small or because the sample did not contain DNA. I don't know. But see, this, this is what I mean about some of these documentaries is they tried to like make it such a big deal and they didn't do a good job with like the editing and the way they like put it together and stuff. But, you know, as a viewer, you're sitting there, it's like, wait a minute. 
they would have found DNA or blood in her trunk in her car. Surely that would have made the news, right? And it's like, yeah, of course. But again, I did think it was interesting that we got sort of a look at sort of the inner workings of how Kentucky does like their the forensic testing and stuff. I thought that was interesting. I thought it was interesting that Sherry had her daughter's car and all the stuff that was left behind. Like that was super interesting to me. So that's why, you know, I decided to bring it up. In the documentary, they, like I said, they talked to the Ballards and Casey, Crystal's brother, uh, took the documentary to the scene of Tommy's death. I remember I said this was on a piece of family property that they hunted on and they have like a memorial erected on their property um, for Tommy. And so in the documentary, you know, Casey is is showing the documentary, you know, the, the land that they're at. And, you know, you can see it's large swath, beautiful, you know, piece of land. And over like, you know, in one direction is, is the BG the parkway. And so you know how it usually is when you have a private property that runs alongside like a busy highway, there's usually privacy hedges, right? There's usually some sort of tree line or something that blocks the view. And so in the documentary, Casey is is showing them and he's like, yeah, so you have this this like tree line, this, this line of like hedges and trees, thick branches and stuff. And it created this sort of like privacy tree line that separated the family property from the BG. Now, what was interesting that they showed in the documentary was that in that tree line, there was like this gap, all right? There was like this huge gap in the tree line. Now, Casey said that when the police were on scene, they focused on that area and he brought the documentary to that area. And you can see very clearly on the documentary, the branches, the trees, and all the brush there had been hacked away and quite recently. You know, like it was very obvious. Like you guys know how long it takes for trees and brush and stuff like that to grow, especially grow where it's all like entangled and sort of creates its own little wall. That takes a while, right? And there was just very obvious like cutting and hashing marks as if someone had like hacked through all that brush to have like a clear line of sight to the property. It was so interesting in the documentary. Um, I I thought it was interesting And I feel like it's something that makes sense that the police wouldn't report on really a whole lot. In fact, the reporting on Tommy's death was pretty minuscule. Like it was really difficult for me to find like nitty gritty information about it. So yeah, maybe that is something the police were looking at. It was certainly interesting to see on the documentary. Casey, you know, was saying that like my family's owned this property for a while. That has never been there. That gap in that tree line had never been there. So the documentary crew then brought in a retired ATF agent and his name's Jim Cavanaugh. And this is what I like about documentaries is when they can bring in, like I said, experts, usually retired. They bring in experts to kind of get their their summation of, of the crime scene, of the information. I love when documentaries do that. I think it's super interesting. So they brought in this, this ATF special agent guy who's retired to kind of get his thoughts on, on the scene of, of Tommy's death. Now, right off the bat, he noted where Tommy was when he was shot from the tree line that they saw that the gap, he noted that like the distance right there, that was only approximately 72 yards or so, which according to Kavanaugh was a pretty easy shot with a rifle, especially if you were a shooter and knew what you were doing. He theorized that the gap, like slash clearing in, in the tree line there had been purposely made so that the shooter would have some sort of like lookout point to see when Tommy would, you know, come into range. Another thing that was like super interesting, you know, so as like Kavanaugh and Stanton and the crew are sort of like examining the gap where the tree is, Kavanaugh noticed this like huge divot in in a tree and him and Stanton both were like, oh dude, this looks like a kickback, which is not the same as a recoil from a gun. So, you know, the recoil and how powerful it is, as we know, is dependent on like the cartridge, but the kickback is how the firearm reacts reacts to that recoil is how they explained it. And so Kavanaugh was like, this looks like, you know, like a kickback from, you know, from a gun after a shot has been made. And so he kind of lined up how he believed that divot had gotten there. And he he theorized, and you can see it on the documentary, he stands up like right with the tree and kind of gets the rifle. And he's like, so yeah, if you're with your, your rifle and, you know, you kind of like lean up like this and it like, like he was saying how it like perfectly lined up that it would 
you know, create that divot. He also theorized that like, yeah, at this spot where this tree was, he's like, I, I really think that the shooter, the, the killer of Tommy was standing right here when he took that shot. And Kavanaugh also pointed out, like, remember, this didn't have to be a one man job because on the other side of that tree line was the BG. He could have absolutely had a getaway driver. You know what I mean? It was all just very interesting. Um, Interesting getting like former law enforcement and experts like opinion, the, the clearing in the gap, like that gave me goosebumps. I was like, oh my God, that's creepy. Like Tommy's death was already super suspicious and already it's like, bro, come on. That was not no hunting accident. Come on. He was clearly murdered. Like as soon as I came across that update, I was like, oh, come on, dude. Homeboy was totally murdered. And seeing Again, I get it. It's the documentary. So they do have like a certain bias. You know, they have like a certain point of view and story they want to tell. But it was just super interesting. I thought that was super interesting and wanted to share it with you guys and get your thoughts on that. Kavanaugh ended up ruling that in his personal opinion, based on his experience and what he saw out there, there was no way this was a hunting accident. And then in the documentary, they also did the same time that, you know, Tommy died. It was dark. And then they like, they, they lined it up to how Kavanaugh theorized it went down. And from what they showed on the documentary, like everything lined up and stuff. So yeah, I just thought that was super, super interesting. Also in the documentary that was really interesting is Casey, remember that's Crystal's brother. He revealed that Trenton told him Remember, Trenton was Crystal's son who was with Tommy when he died. So Casey said that Trenton told him that when he and Tommy were walking along in the minutes before Tommy died, they were walking along and right where they would have been in sight of that gap slash clearing in the tree line, Trenton said that Tommy reached out his hand across his chest to like, you know, stop him from going forward, stopped, got his gun from his shoulder and started looking in the scope. And yeah, they were, you know, questioning on the documentary, like, did Tommy catch a glare from a scope? What did he see that he stopped his grandson from walking forward? And now this is where I was a little confused. I may have misunderstood, but I thought Casey said in the documentary that it was like, mere moments after this that Tommy was then shot. But all the reports said that Trenton was at the truck getting something when Tommy was shot. So maybe I just misunderstood what Casey was saying. But either way, thought that was super, super interesting. Another cool thing that they shared in the documentary was that the Ballard family, for the first time publicly, shared the like massive case file that Tommy had started when his daughter disappeared. It was pretty amazing. Like every single lead, every single single tip, every little thing that you could possibly think that Tommy could track down in relation to his daughter's disappearance. He tracked it down and compiled it into this like huge case file. And I know Stanton was saying that especially, you know, himself as a homicide detective was very impressed with, you know, just the amount of organization and filing and stuff that Tommy had done. Dudes, when I say Tommy dedicated his life to finding his daughter, like I'm not exaggerating. Like you can see in the documentary, like it's wild. It's a huge case file. And the Ballards did not allow the journalist and Stanton to like take the case file with them, but like they were allowed to make copies and stuff like that. And uh, it was just, it was really amazing. Like I said, you can read stories of just how dedicated Tommy was to finding his daughter, but to like see that case file and see like all the information he gathered, like man, it, it was incredible. And it's just, it's so fucking sad that he died. It was murdered, honestly. Like, come on, dude, come on. He's murdered without knowing what happened to his daughter. That I think is, is the real bitch of it. It's so infuriating. Like, it's not fair. So even though that was cool, right, to see, you know, this huge case file that Tommy had and really see how much, you know, he worked at trying to find his daughter and what happened to her. One thing the documentary tried really hard to make a huge deal of was this letter that the Ballards had received from an inmate, all right? They had received this letter in March of 2016. Now, this inmate was in a Kentucky prison, all right? And this inmate claimed to have not just knowledge of Crystal's disappearance, but of the other high-profile murders in Bardstown as well. Mm. Now, apparently when the Ballards initially got this letter, they did try to arrange a meetup with this inmate. However, they were told the inmate had been transferred to another facility, which from my understanding, like, isn't 
too uncommon, I guess. And then I guess when you are transferred, like sometimes you're put in like a holding facility and like there sometimes it's on like lockdown. So you don't receive like mail or communications and no one knows where you're at or something. I saw some people talking about this in another a separate true crime thread on Reddit that I was reading and it was just really interesting. So when the Ballard explained that in the documentary, I was like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if that's what happened here. The inmate was in some sort of like holding facility. And then after this, the Ballards didn't like pursue this further. You know what I mean? So they didn't know what happened to him after they were told, oh, he transferred somewhere. We don't know where or whatever. They just sort of like dropped it. You know what I mean? But in the documentary, you know, they tried to get a hold of the inmate, which, you know, they, they did get a hold of, which, you know, I guess it isn't too surprising considering the resources you know, behind an oxygen documentary, like you're working with a budget. And I think the Stephanie Bauer chick is a journalist. So, you know, I'm sure she has experience getting in contact with people. I'm sure that Staten guy had a lot of contacts and stuff. So I guess not too unbelievable, right? Now in the documentary, um, yeah, the journalist like asks him, like, why did he write the letter to the Ballards and stuff? And of course, we just have audio of this, you know, they, they didn't physically go see the inmates just all over audio. And the inmate said that like, oh, he just felt sorry for the Ballards. And he thought Crystal looked familiar in that she had been a friend of his cousins. And so all of that made him want to like reach out to the Ballards and supposedly tell them all he knew. Now, this inmate in the documentary, all right, claimed that Crystal had been, quote, cut up, had been taken to White Mills, Kentucky. And there her body was burned in a garage that had also been set on fire. Now, when the journalist, you know, like, you know, she asked him in the documentary, like, okay, like, how do you know all this? He said that he knew from his cousin, who, quote, runs with a lot of people. He then went on to say that his cousin witnessed a murder herself in 2017 and was like murdered herself. Yeah, come on, dude. He allegedly led them to the location of this burned down garage. And so... In the documentary, they do find a like burned down foundation and, you know, they did some digging and it did used to be a garage and it did have a history of catching fire. They like pulled 911 calls from like the last handful of years where people were reporting that it was on fire. And so like the documentary was trying to be like, oh, maybe this inmate like knows what he's talking about, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know, man, like to me, the inmate did not sound credible. I mean, inmate confessions are already kind of kind of sus as it is, right? Like you got to take them with a grain of salt. An inmate confession, right, is usually like in addition to other evidence. So unless other evidence comes to light, um, maybe one day we'll know more. I would really take this inmate's like little confession with a grain of salt. I know the documentary tried really hard to make it seem like, ooh, yeah, could, you know, could he have known what he was talking about? But I don't know. Like, frankly, I think it was a big nothing burger. In the documentary, though, they did go to Melody Lake. Remember, we talked about Melody Lake in the last video. And there, investigators allegedly, you know, found some evidence off Melody Lake, though they never disclosed what that evidence was. So in the documentary, they went ahead and went back to Melody Lake and they took a cadaver dog. And it was in the documentary that Sherry revealed that in the two and a half years that Melody Lake had been searched, it had been searched with cadaver dogs three times. And every time, multiple dogs would hit in one specific location of the lake. I believe I briefly mentioned that in a uh, part one. And I'm guessing it's probably due to these hits of the cadaver dogs that one of the theories in the case is that Crystal's body may have been disposed of in Melody Lake, which again is very near the Hauk family farm. And in the documentary, you know, they brought the cadaver dog again. And again, I guess the the dog hit in the same general location that all the cadaver dogs had hit on. And the documentary, of course, had their own divers go and search. And of course they found nothing. The bottom of this lake is super muddy. Like the divers were saying they were like going to the bottom of the lake and they were going in like all the way up to their elbow. And it was just pure muck and mud. The dive expert that they interviewed in the documentary said that like given unlimited time and resources, right? It would take months 
to thoroughly search every square inch of Melody Lake. And I know Sherry said that she herself had tried to get that lake drained herself. So yeah, who's to say if they could ever find anything in Melody Lake, considering, you know, the thick mud. Although they did say that they supposedly found a piece of evidence, you know, on Melody Lake. We don't know what that is. So yeah, time will tell how Melody Lake plays into this case. I just thought it was, you know, an interesting piece of information because I couldn't find a lot of local reporting on the Melody Lake search. I found more information on the Marion County the Sportsman Lake search. So yeah, that was pretty much what I felt was, was uh, highlight worthy and, and noteworthy in the Oxygen documentary. In October of 2018, now Captain Snow gave an update on Crystal's case and he stated that it had not grown cold and that he had actually worked hundreds of hours of overtime working her case, like assuring the public, you know, her case is not dead. You know, it is very alive and kicking. He said, quote, we really only get one shot at that. So if we prosecute too early or go after someone without the proper evidence, that person may be acquitted and we may never get another chance to prosecute the person that is responsible for it. We really need to find out what happened to Crystal and we really need to bring some closure to the Ballard family. He stated that 70 two search warrants had been served and executed throughout the course of the investigation and 172 pieces of evidence had been collected. Um, Knowing what we know with the crime lab, I wonder how many pieces of that evidence will get tested. But remember, they did say that, you know, there was ways to to get around that with court orders and stuff. Considering how high profile the Bardstown cases are, I'm sure hopefully it won't be a problem getting evidence processed, right? Sherry said of the update, quote, I think every day we're getting a little bit closer. I do think one day I'm going to find justice for my daughter. She admitted that she had been a little disappointed in the early days of her daughter's investigation, but quote, I think they're working their butts off now to find justice for Crystal. I do think that now, and I applaud them for that. I think everyone would love to find justice for my family. I have no doubt about that. I think there will be a lot of happy people when justice is finally done. And then, get this, the next month in November, a three-judge panel revoked Sherry's visitation with Eli. Yeah, I'm not sure Remember, Brooks said that he was going to appeal the decision because the um, Ballards had taken him to court and forced visitation with Eli. They got every other weekend. And then I guess, you know, they've been doing that up until that point. And then in November of 2018, this three-judge panel revoked her visitation rights. And I don't know if it was in response to Brooks' appeal, if he won that or what. The reporting was very minuscule. It was just those couple sentences. So I'm not sure what happened. I was like, dude, poor Sherry dude. She just like keeps getting screwed. On July 3rd, 2019, in what had become a very depressing tradition in the town, a memorial slash vigil service was held for Crystal at the St. Thomas Church. Sherry said, quote, police told me it would probably take a year before anything could happen. And I just thought there's no way I'm waiting a year. So for me to have to still be here and it's the fourth year, it's just so hard for me to do that. To think she'd just be forgotten and I don't know where she's at. I just don't think about that. That can't be an option. When I think about the last time I saw Crystal, it feels forever like so, so long ago. And then the very next month on Sunday, August 18th, at around 10 p.m., the Bardstown Fire Department was called out to a home that was currently being built by Brooks. It had been set on fire, and by the time that the fire crews arrived, the whole structure was engulfed. Thankfully, um, it was just like the wooden foundation that had been put up, so I don't think the fire got like too out of control or anything like that. Immediately, the fire department suspected arson. Quote, there's no power to the home, no gas to it, so obviously it was set somehow. There was no reason for Hauk to be involved to burn down his own home. And this is what the fire investigator told the press. They were saying that it was disgruntled employees who had formerly worked for Brooks who had set the fire. And again, I just mentioned that as a, as like, man, fire just like follows this guy around. I just thought that was, you know, an interesting little update to the case. Or I guess not even really to the case, I guess to Brooks. In June of 2020, after more than five years had passed since her mother's disappearance, one of Crystal's daughters, Kylie Fenwick spoke out about, you know, how difficult life was uh, without her mother. She was only 14 when her mother disappeared. Quote, waking up every day 
day and not being able to wake up and be like, hey mom, and what are you going to do today? Just like normal little things. Little things really matter more than the big, huge things. People say it gets easier. It never gets easier. She continued on, quote, like graduation. When I graduated high school, seeing all the kids with their moms and they were like so proud, I knew my mom was proud, but just like wanting her to be there physically, it was very hard to see other moms there. Kylie said that she had started a journal since her mom had gone missing. And in it, she wrote down like everyday things, things that like happened to her and that, you know, were happening in life um, as if she were actually talking to her mother, such as, you know, telling her about her high school graduation, quote, telling her this. And then the very next page, I'll be telling her, well, this is very serious. Like you should have been there. Like she's just right over my shoulder talking back and reading what I'm writing. Sherry, meanwhile, said that she couldn't believe it had been five years since her daughter disappeared. Quote, so to think that it's been five years has been very, very hard. It's very hard. It's very, very hard. She spoke about how absolutely sure that Brooks was guilty. Quote, in my heart, I know he's 100% guilty. And I just think to myself, your day is coming. At this time, it was announced that Captain Snow was retiring. So a new lead detective would now be taking over Crystal's case. Her name was Jody Gilliland. Maybe it's Gilliland. I'm gonna go with Gilliland. Sherry said of the update, quote, I do believe that I am going to get that justice. I can tell you if I was not happy with where my daughter's case was going, I would not be quiet like I am now. I've been very quiet for a reason, so I'm very satisfied. Kylie asked that everyone keep her family in your thoughts and prayers, saying, quote, everybody keep praying and don't lose the hope. They give us hope and keep us going. And as was traditional, a memorial and vigil service was held in Crystal's memory on July 1st at St. Thomas. Then, get this, later that same month in July of 2020, more than 150 state and federal law enforcement officials descended upon Bardstown. FBI Louisville said that they were working with the IRS, the KSP, and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they were going to, quote, bring a fresh perspective to the case. Yeah, dude, stuff was going down. Can you, like, I read that update and I saw the picture. I was like, oh my God, that's like from a movie. Like all of a sudden, all these like federal and state officials come swooping down on this small town. It was a pretty wild update. FBI Louisville Special Agent in Charge Robert Brown said in a statement, quote, the FBI is committed to bringing those responsible to justice, but we are going to need the community's assistance. I I ask that members of the community feed back to July 3rd and 4th of 2015. For those individuals who have information about this incident, but who have not yet spoken to law enforcement for whatever reason, please contact us. On the first day that the feds were in Bardstown alone, they executed nine search warrants and conducted over 50 interviews. One of those searches was for Brooks' home, Nick's home, and the Houck family farm. Apparently agents like broke in Brooks uh, front door when they raided his house. And I guess members of the IRS could be seen taking just dozens and dozens of boxes from Brooks home. They also took two filing cabinets and two guns. And it was reported that authorities had seized four large weapons from Nick's home. I guess they also searched a white pickup truck that was uh, in his driveway as well, including like looking under the hood. Apparently a very thorough search. At the farm, they primarily focused on the ponds and a certain wooded area, and the farm was the only location they spent more than a day searching. It was also this time when the feds and the state officials were swarming Bardstown that the FBI took possession of Crystal's car back from Sherry. And remember, Sherry had kept it in a storage unit, and there was also a storage unit of Crystal's that had a bunch of her things in it that the FBI also searched. The FBI also announced this time the formation of a website that they had created so people could submit tips. The site included a quote from one of Crystal's daughters that kind of spoke of the lasting memory that her mother would have on her. And it read, quote, my mom is a very special woman. The memory that will forever be in my heart is going to DQ and buying my mom a lunch. We would always get the chicken strip basket with the toast and gravy to go with it. Going over to Mama Martin's and playing phase 10 and aggravation over and over while eating snacks. Since my mom's been missing, life has been really hard. I always wonder what my life would be like if she and my papa were still here. And as had become tradition in this case, get this, get this, the feds and the state officials never revealed what if any evidence they seized during this massive storm on Bardstown. 
Isn't that wild? And then on July 23rd, it was rumored that possible human remains had been found at the county line between Nelson County and Washington County. But the authorities did not tell the public much about what they found or suspected to find. Quote, out of respect for family members of multiple missing persons in these areas, we will not be commenting on this until we have more information from the lab. And this was the statement that the Nelson County Sheriff's Office had put out. On July 24th, the FBI FBI evidence response team reported to the area. Apparently the area where the supposed remains were was pretty hard to recover. They were in some sort of like hard to reach area or whatever. Chief Grayson with the Nelson County Fire Department said that he hoped if the remains turned out to be someone that it could bring some family closure quote, I think it could inspire some hope for the next step, whatever that may be. You know, I'm not in law enforcement. We're just firefighters here. But I think, you know, it could bring some sort of hope or some sort of closure or justices in the future. You know, just by having something to bury and, you know, something to say goodbye to or whatever, you know, if it is. And then on August 6th, 2020, the FBI officially took over Crystal's case. They then spent several more days searching Brooke's home and the farm. They also canvassed the neighborhood of Lookout Court in Valley View Estates in Bardstown to talk to neighbors. Apparently, they had received dozens of tips submitted to the website from this neighborhood, so the feds were now conducting interviews. None of the neighbors would tell the press what they discussed with the feds or anything for fear of jeopardizing the case. So yeah, people were like, oh my god, like what? What were the feds, you know, talking to all these neighbors about? Nobody knows. And this is also when they searched a crystal storage unit. I think I said earlier that they had already searched it. This is when the FBI searched her storage unit, and not even the Ballards knew what they were looking for. On August 14th, the FBI identified a new area of interest in relation to the case. It was near Poplar Flats Road and Farmaway Drive in Bardstown, and they asked the public to remember if they were in this area in the early morning hours of July 4th, 2015, and if they were, to contact them. Assistant Special Agent in Charge Brian Jones voiced that if they could solve Crystal's case, they may very well be able to solve the other Bardstown case including Tommy's. Quote, it is very rare to have all these cases that are potentially connected in a small community like Nelson County. I think that potentially solving any of these cases could bring resolution to the other ones. Sherry said that these searches renewed hope for the family that, you know, something was going to come and come soon. Quote, it's very hard for me to sit and wait, but I know the end result is going to be worth it. So I sit and I wait and I think if they find who was guilty for Crystal, then I think they will have justice for Tommy too. And once again, the public was not told what, if any evidence, the FBI had collected. All we knew is that the FBI officially took over the case and, like, had conducted, you know, more raids and searches. In November of 2020, the FBI announced that the human remains that were found on that county line were not crystal. And it is said, from what I could find, that to this day, those remains have not been publicly identified. On the four-year anniversary, I know, four years already, on the four-year year anniversary of Tommy's death on November 19th, 2020. Sherry spoke out, did some interviews with the local news media and stuff. She was, you know, trying to keep both of her husband and daughter's cases alive. And she said, quote, I don't want anybody to forget what happened to my family and that we are still looking for answers. She talked about Tommy and his never ending crusade in finding Crystal. Quote, if he wasn't out physically searching, he was on the computer looking up stuff. He promised the kids he would bring their mom home and he never gave up on that. Brooke, Crystal's sister, said, quote, all he wanted was to bring his daughter home. I know everybody thinks about us and it means a lot to us and don't give up because we're not. And Sherry said, even though that they believed the answers were going to be forthcoming, you know, they were going to find out what happened. It was hard knowing that Tommy wouldn't be around to see it. Quote, it's really hard for me to know he's not going to be here but I know he's going to know it. In August of 2021, yeah, so a long period of no real updates in the case. Then in August of 2021, the FBI once again came to Bardstown and stayed more than seven days. This time while they were here, they conducted several searches in the Woodlawn Springs subdivision in Bardstown. This was an area the Brooks had been building slash developing some homes at the time Crystal disappeared. The FBI announced in a tweet Quote, based on the information collected over the last year by the federal investigation into the disappearance of Crystal Rogers, FBI Louisville,
Mill is now conducting several searches in the Woodlawn Springs subdivision. They honed in on three specific homes, and then they lasered in on one home in particular. This home had been built by Brooks, and he had owned it at one point in time. But at this time in 2021, when the feds were searching it, he did not own it. Agents only told the public that they had found two items of interest at this home, and that these two items had been sent to their crime lab in Quantico, Virginia to be tested, but they didn't disclose what those items were. Sherry only told the media that all she knew was that these items were found like under a driveway and the FBI would actually have to end up spending $28,000 repairing the driveway of that home. So yeah, maybe that evidence did come from the driveway because I read a report that yeah, the FBI had to pay 28 grand and to repair that driveway. The driveway, by the way, had originally been laid by Brooks and his company. On the seven year anniversary of Crystal's disappearance, on July 3rd, 2022, Sherry talked about how difficult the 4th of July holiday was for her and her family now. Quote, when you're living your everyday life, you never forget this. You never forget it. But when stuff happens, it brings it all right back to the surface again. And you're stuck like it just happened again. And it's very emotional and very hard on my whole entire family. Time does not heal wounds. It might help you learn to adapt, but one little bitty thing can pull it back to the surface at any minute. And as had become a tradition in the town, a prayer service slash vigil was held at the St. Thomas Church with pink bows being set up all around town in Crystal's honor. And then on October 17th, 2022, a search warrant was served by federal agents once again on the Hauk family farm. I know so many searches on this farm. They had to have collected actual evidence by this point, right? They spent five days on the farm using drones cadaver dogs, and excavating equipment. And they were primarily focused on a very small portion of the 200 plus acre farm. Now, the feds did not say at all what they were looking for, only that there was a quote, good chance investigators would find what they were looking for. I know, right? What is it? They maintained that the work they were currently doing and had been doing for Crystal's case was not for public consumption, and they declined to release any details whatsoever. After the search had been completed, Special Agent Jody Cohen only said that evidence had been collected. That's all she would say. Quote, we hope that the evidence collected will move our investigation one step closer to holding accountable the individual or individuals responsible for Crystal Rogers' disappearance. She did not specify what the evidence was and just verified that evidence had been collected and it had been sent to the lab in Quantico. Right? We're, like, I read that. I was like, dude, what did they find? What could they have found? Remains? Like, man, I... Time will tell, man. Like, I do feel like the talk, the, the talk, the clock is ticking. I really do. I feel like we will see a resolution to this case. Sherry was informed of the search and she said, quote, I'm praying today I find answers. I don't really know how I feel. I'm trying not to get too excited about it because I don't want such a letdown if nothing is found. But at the same time, how can I not? I'm just praying God is giving me the answers today or tomorrow or whenever it takes. I'm happy they're on the farm. I've never felt satisfied with that farm. So I'm happy about that. She stated that she was grateful for everything that the FBI had done on her daughter's case thus far. They'd kept her informed and up to date as much as they could, but you know, she understood that they couldn't tell her everything, right? Quote, everything they do is a blessing to me because it may take me one step closer to finding my daughter. It's such a huge farm. It takes so long to go through something like that. And I guess as a mom, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, gosh, could she still be there? I guess until I find her, I'm never going to be happy with that farm. I always think that's the last place she was seen. Could she be there? And maybe it was overlooked. We've searched through the woods numerous times and we have walked through something and come back by and seen something we totally missed. She wondered if the farm was even really the last place her daughter had been. Quote, you know, they've never really given me an answer on that. Just because Brooks said they went to the farm, that's the only answer I've ever got, is that Brooks said that was the last place that they went. I don't even know for sure that my daughter made it to that farm, honestly. I don't have proof of that, and I'm sure the police are not sharing everything. They can't share everything. She said that she primarily wanted to know more about her daughter's car. 
quote, the only thing that would be in the back of my mind is how my daughter's car got on that BG. Someone had to see that car on that BG. It was a busy holiday weekend, and I can't believe that nobody saw that car just dropped off there. So if it strikes someone's memory that they may have seen that, that's the biggest thing I would want out there. That if anybody saw her car on that BG, if they could just come forward. Sherry speculated that it was possible Crystal's car had been set there as a complete diversion. Who knows? Andy Carey, remember of the Carey Sign Company who had put up like all the signs for Crystal free of charge? He once again distributed uh, these signs once again for free, uh, kind of renewing them when this uh, latest search happened. He said, quote, why do you think they're out there? What's bringing the FBI back to the farm? Did they overlook something maybe the last time they were out there? Maybe this is the last piece they need to do what they need to do to maybe make an indictment. I think that family deserves some closure and hopefully they can get some answers. Sherry did believe that the FBI was getting close. Quote, I know they're in the last steps. I know they're getting close. They're close and my close is not the same thing. I'm wanting this done seven years ago. The FBI guy who's doing this is excellent. He's doing an excellent job. I have no complaints about that. It's getting all the prosecutors on board and getting them where they need to be. That is the area I need to work on more than anything. She believed justice is coming and held on to her belief. Brooks possibly with the help of his family, had murdered her daughter. Quote, life just goes on for them like it's nothing, and my whole world has been crushed. I just want them to pay for what they did to my family. I want justice. She thanked the community for their continuing support, saying, quote, I can honestly tell you without the support of this community backing me, I could not be where I'm at today. It's nice to know that people feel what I feel in my heart, and that they really do support me on that, and they're vocal about it when I'm out in public, and I appreciate all their prayers. And then, the very next month, on November November 3rd, 2022, Brooks was arrested, but once again, not in relation to Crystal's case. It was even more ridiculous than the, the Lowe's theft thing. He was arrested for failure to pay court fines and traffic citations. Yeah. Nelson County Sheriff deputies served a warrant on Brooks at a Bardstown subdivision that he was working at and hauled him into jail. Now, according to court records, he was arrested for failure to pay traffic citations. And the charge listed on the Nelson County Jail website said, quote, non-payment of court costs, fees, or fines as the reason um, under his booking. He was charged with seven traffic violations, including improper use of farm plates and no or improper license in December of 2021. The prosecutor later dismissed the five other charges. Brooks ended up pleading guilty to the two charges in January of 2022 and had been ordered to pay a series of fines starting in April of that same year, even being granted installment payments. And according to court records, when Brooks was arrested in November, he only owed the court $353. And only two days before he had been arrested on November 1st, he was cited for not wearing a seatbelt. And in the end, he was in the county jail for a very short period of time before he posted bail. And I just thought that was so weird. Like 353 bucks, that cannot be that much to, to him. He owns his own like develop uh, development uh, company and like he rents out properties. Like there's no way the Hawks are hurting for cash. And I just thought it was so so weird that he would allow like a fine to get to the point where he was like arrested on it. Like, I don't know. I just thought that was super weird. And it was the same month in November that the six year anniversary of Tommy's death came around and still there were no answers or evidence or updates in the case. His case was being handled by the KSP. And at this point, his death had been ruled a homicide by the FBI. And poor Sherry talked about like the pain she had to endure. Like she has two awful anniversaries to contend with now. She said, quote, I'll go by the graveyard, but it's very hard for me to relive that day. And, you know, she maintained to her her belief that she never believed her husband's uh, death was an accident. Quote, there's a murderer out there walking around that murdered my husband. I want people to know he's still out there and I'm still pushing for justice. And she maintained her belief that once she found out what happened to Crystal, she would find out what happened to Tommy. Quote, nothing would have stopped him, you know. He was going to bring our daughter home. And she maintained that he was more than likely murdered because he was getting close to finding out what happened to Crystal. That is Sherry's belief. That is the whole Ballard family's belief. She said that she did like to think of her daughter and husband reunited somewhere in the afterlife. Quote, I look at that all the time and I think he did find our daughter. Sherry talked about the farm searches that had been conducted by the FBI, specifically the, the latest one that had happened in October. Quote, they are still waiting on lab results. I don't understand why that stuff takes so long, but gosh, they're still waiting on some from the time they searched the farm before. She talked about trying to live her day-to-day -day life, especially caring for Crystal's children now. 
quote, you know, I still have two kids and they deserve a mother. And get this, all right? So if Shira's life wasn't already crap, if she already didn't have enough stress on her plate, get this. In the same month of November when all of this was going on, Brooks tried to open a daycare center. But, but wait, wait, it gets weirder. So on August 17th, Brooks had filed a permit application with the Nelson County Planning and Zoning, and he had filed it on the former People's Church building that he owned. He wanted to change that building's use from being a church into a daycare center. On top of that, this building was directly across the street from Sherry's storage business that she owned and operated. Yeah, Sherry called his daycare plans, quote, absurd and unusual. And she believed that Brooks had only done this to, to taunt her and that he had done this on purpose. Quote, I think it's taunting for me. Am I comfortable with him being across the street from me? Of course I am not. Number one, I'm shocked that someone that's a main suspect in a disappearance of a mother can even try to open a daycare. I would be totally shocked if anyone sent their kids to that daycare. I cannot imagine that happening. A petition was actually started to block Brooks' efforts, and it was started by another local business owner, Don Thrasher, who owned the local Liberty Tax location. He said, quote, We need to bring it to people's attention and formally ask the Kentucky Division of Regulated Child Care to withhold any licensing because I believe he has questionable character. Sherry, she, she she holds on though, and she said, quote, it seems like it just keeps coming, you know? I don't get a break, but I'm going to see this to the end. And I couldn't find an update to his daycare plans. I just thought that was super weird. Clearly taunting, right? Like, why? Why a daycare? And then like, yeah, Sherry has a point. It's like, bro, you are a publicly named suspect slash main person of interest in the disappearance of a mother. Where do you get off trying to open a daycare? You know what I mean? Like so weird. In January of 2023, it was announced that a special prosecutor was appointed to investigate Crystal and Tommy's cases, as well as the other unsolved case of Jason Ellis out of Bardstown. Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron appointed Commonwealth's attorney Shane Young to assist the AG's office and the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Kentucky. Quote, in the prosecution, if any, of potential criminal charges related to the deaths of Jason Ellis, Crystal Rogers, and Tommy Ballard. Young's appointment officially began on January 4th, 2023, and his appointment actually replaced Gogan. When asked why the change, the AG spokesman slash statement read slash said, quote, the Office of Attorney General has made some administrative adjustments in the case in order to streamline a continued effort toward justice for the victims, their families, and the people of Nelson County. These minor alterations clarified lines of authority in order to make the combined efforts of the dedicated law enforcement officials involved more efficient in pursuing an investigation. Sherry was elated at this latest news and she said, quote, finding my daughter would help tremendous. You know, we could put her at rest and it's so hard getting up every day not knowing where she's at. She seemed optimistic at Young's appointment. Quote, he seems very dedicated and he seems very optimistic and very positive. So I have to go with that and pray things are going to work out. My husband and daughter were very good people and they did not deserve what happened to them. And that is all we know about the case of Crystal Rogers and her father. And yeah, what do you guys think? I feel like we are definitely going to see a resolution to this case, right? I feel like they're getting closer and closer. The fact they now have like a special prosecutor, that seems to be the latest update that I could find. And yeah, man, we'll see. <sighs> who knows what's involved. I know there's so many theories and guesses of what people think happened, of who's involved. I know the most common like theory I see is that like Brooks killed Crystal and Nick helped. Perhaps Brooks and Nick killed her. Most people seem to think that Brooks and Nick are definitely working together. Who knows? There are other people who think there is a cover-up if not in Crystal and Tommy's case, in some of the other Bardstown cases, because a lot of people just don't understand how so many of these cases could remain unsolved. And I kind of thought that too, until I heard that part of the documentary about like the limited resources and stuff that the state of Kentucky has. And 
that kind of, you know, explains a lot. That could be why, you know, it's unsolved is, you know, the resources dedicated to these just are pretty non-existent. I don't know. We'll see. I definitely feel like we're close to, to a resolution in Tommy and Crystal's case. And yeah, like, I don't know. I think his death is absolutely related to his daughters. What do you guys think? Like, do you think it's just a coincidence? I know the way he was killed is very similar to the way that Officer Ellis was killed. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I certainly think the Hawks, um, specifically Brooks and Nick, are definitely suspicious. Like, come on, dude. Like, so many searches of the Hauk family farm, Anna's home, Brooks' home, Nick's home. Come on, like, right? Like, law enforcement doesn't do numerous searches like that if there's nothing, right? I don't know, man. I don't know. Hopefully I'll be able to repost this video with an update and we'll get a resolution. We'll get an answer to a lot of questions that we have. And I really hope that the Ballards get answers because fuck man, it's just not fair how much crap this family has been thrown. It, it's really not right. At the very least, I mean, I, I guess at least their case is in the the national spotlight, right? And at least like the FBI is now taking over. So that's more resources and stuff. So yeah, hopefully very, very soon we'll have some very important updates that will include a, uh, an arrest and eventually a trial and conviction. And it'd be really nice if we could find out, you know, where Crystal is and what happened to her, you know? Man, thank you so much, Casey Gibbs, for pointing me to Bardstown, Kentucky. I definitely cannot wait to dive in to the other unsolved cases in Bardstown. Pretty wild, man. Pretty wild. And it's such a shame that, like, these cases are what Bardstown is known for because it's really pretty. The documentary showed all kinds of like drone footage and stuff and it's super pretty. So it's a shame that there's this like big ugly stink over it, you know? Man, that, that was a lot. Yeah, I just don't have a lot of time. I'm so exhausted. I gotta go take care of my cat now. He's got his cone of shame and yeah, I gotta watch out for him and I'm so tired. I've gotten maybe, maybe 20 hours of sleep the, the past five or six days, like total. Yeah. So thank you so much for understanding. Thank you for hanging out with me every week. I appreciate you all so much. And next week we will dive into another multi-parter. Yeah, this one is wild and mind blowing. So until we meet again next week, stay safe and happy out there. Don't be a dick. Leave a little sparkle wherever you go and can't wait to see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.